While everyone was distracted with OpenAI drama, Inflection quietly released the second most powerful behind only GPT-4. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in around five minutes. As you well know, the week leading up to the Thanksgiving holiday in the U.S. was completely and utterly dominated by the OpenAI saga. Sam Altman was fired, and then he wasn't, and then he was, and then he wasn't, and then he was, and then he wasn't, and then ultimately he came back, but in a slightly less powerful form. Now, later in this episode, in the main part of the episode, we'll get into the most recent information we've gotten around what might have been behind that firing. But in the meantime, another big AI lab, Inflection, which is of course led by Mustafa Suleiman, the former CEO of Google DeepMind, and was also co-founded by Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, announced that they had finished training Inflection 2, and that according to their claims, it was the second best LLM in the world, following only GPT-4. So, on November 22nd, Inflection posted Inflection 2, the next step up on their blog. They write, Today we are proud to announce that we have completed training of Inflection 2, the best model in the world for its compute class, and the second most capable LLM in the world today. Now, of course, for those who aren't familiar with Inflection, Inflection is the company and the model behind Pi, which is a personal AI. As it writes when you first go to pi.ai, My goal is to be useful, friendly, and fun. Ask me for advice, for answers, or let's talk about whatever's on your mind. So basically, this is a company that's making a very different bet around what's going to be important about the future of AI. Or at least, it's not so much that they're betting that things like coding assistants aren't going to be important. It's just that they think that those social human interactive type of elements are also going to be extremely important, and they saw a market gap in people addressing that particular need. Now, when they say that they are the highest ranked in their compute class, they're comparing themselves to Google's Palm 2 model because they were trained on 5,000 NVIDIA H100 GPUs. They write, Designed with serving efficiency in mind, Inflection 2 will soon be powering Pi, thanks to a transition from A100 to H100 GPUs, as well as our highly optimized inference implementation, we managed to reduce the cost and increase the speed of serving versus Inflection 1, despite Inflection 2 being multiple times larger. Now, in terms of that claim that they are the second most performant model now, they're using the MMLU benchmark, on which for reference, GPT 3.5 scores a 70, and GPT 4 scores an 86.4. Meta's Llama 2 70B model comes in at 68.9, so right around GPT 3.5. Inflection 1's was a little bit ahead at 72.7. Grok 1 was just ahead of that at 73. Palm 2's large model was at 78.3. Claude 2 was at 78.5. And Inflection 2 came in at 79.6 again trailing only GPT-4's 86.4. Now, the other thing to note is that code and mathematical reasoning continue to not be an explicit focus in the training for Inflection 2. That said, even without it being an explicit focus, they saw distinct improvements from Inflection 1. Now, of course, in addition to just this being a feather in the cap for Inflection, it's generated a lot of conversation around the state of the AI frontier model wars. Professor Ethan Mollick from Wharton writes, Speculation. Nobody has publicly beat GPT-4 yet, so if OpenAI keeps shipping and there is an AI learning curve and no diminishing returns to scale, only Google keeps up. But Claude 2 and now Inflection 2 beat GPT 3.5, Grok is at GPT 3.5 level, and those labs are still training. Now he goes on to clarify, by AI learning curve, I mean it in the organizational and not AI sense. Are there increasing returns to building AIs either because of a flywheel, i.e. the AI helps you code the next version, or because of experience, there are tricks you need to know and you learn them as you go? At some point, there are going to be diminishing returns to training due to technical limitations on the scaling law, data limitations, economic limitations, or something else. We just don't know when those hit. Meanwhile, others had a more dismissive and aggressive line on this. Dylan Patel from Semi Analysis writes, There are now five models better than Google's best? Google is an effing joke. XAI's Grok, Inflection 2, Claude 2, GPT-4, GPT-4 Turbo. Where is Gemini? Well, of course, if you've been following this show, you know that Gemini continues to get delayed, but in the meantime, Google is at least continuing to add capacities to their BARD model, which is available now. The latest of those is an integration with YouTube that makes it better able to understand the content in YouTube videos and use that information to handle more complex queries around them. As The Verge writes, The bot's YouTube integration is getting a handy upgrade so it can analyze individual videos to surface specific information for you, like key points or recipe ingredients without ever pressing play. Now, there are a couple interesting points about this. One is just the strategy that we've been noticing a lot, and a theme more broadly, of the period that we're in of AI integration, in which even as the big labs try to race to ever more powerful frontier models, practically for consumers, a lot of the more relevant developments are happening all around us every day. Specifically, 
It's the way that tools that already are released are getting integrated into the workflows and systems that we already use. This is a great example of that, and seemingly Bard's whole strategy is in many ways being better and more thoughtfully integrated across the Google suite of tools which people already use. Now, the Verge author did a little test of this, and he found that it worked really well. They tested it on an America's Test Kitchen recipe for an espresso martini and said Bard got all the critical bits right in summing up the video. The ingredients and measurements are all accurate, and the instructions are correct. It even includes the first step of chilling a martini glass by filling it with ice and water. However, the author also points out an interesting challenge of how generative AI is going to be potentially problematic for creators. Specifically in this case, the author points out that this recipe is never actually included in the show notes, and that to get the recipe in written form, you would have had to go behind a paywall on the America's Test Kitchen website. Now, the reason that they might feel comfortable with the full recipe in the video is that people tend to watch these recipe videos over and over again. So presumably they're getting value from advertising from repeated watching. The author validates that they have to go back and look at this every single time they need it. The challenge now, as the Verge author writes, is by having Bard spit out the recipe for me, I've just skipped the step where I press play, watch a pre-roll ad, and see the channel's other recommended videos at the end. That's great for me, but probably less good for the publisher of the video. Less good or not, it is definitely the future that we are headed into. Now, moving to another big tech company and what they might be doing in AI, today kicks off Amazon Web Services reInvent Conference, which is one of their big annual events of the year. Indeed, it was at this event last year that they had been planning to announce something that they were then calling Amazon Bedrock, which was a foundation model akin to GPT 3.5. The problem was that the model just wasn't ready, and so at the last minute, they scrapped plans to make that announcement. In retrospect, it was a good thing they did because as the event was happening on November 30th, 2022, OpenAI released ChatGPT, which of course went entirely viral. When Amazon realized that Bedrock was not even close to up to snuff with what ChatGPT offered, they shelved that product and in fact shifted their strategy around and Bedrock became the sandbox through which they help enterprise customers customize and deploy a variety of AI models instead of the original wholly owned model that it was supposed to be. However, in recent weeks, we've had rumors that Amazon has still been working on an ambitious frontier model that they codenamed Olympus. According to Reuters sources, Olympus has 2 trillion parameters, which would make it double that of the reported 1 trillion parameters of GPT-4. Now, Reuters is a pretty good publication for this sort of thing, and so people have been assuming that maybe we'll get an announcement about Olympus or whatever they decide to call it publicly at this Amazon reInvent event. The first keynote with AWS CEO Adam Solipsky is tomorrow morning, so of course I will be watching that closely. Meanwhile, a few interesting notes over from the world of geopolitics just to round us out. A group of 18 countries led by the US and Britain have signed a non-binding agreement with principles around how to make AI, quote, secure by design. Basically, they are trying to create some consensus around how to keep AI out of the hands of rogue actors. And a lot of the recommendations, which again are non-binding, are about things like how to monitor AI systems for abuse, how to protect data from tampering, and what sort of testing there needs to be before models are released to the public. Said the director of the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Jen Easterly, this is the first time we have seen an affirmation that these capabilities should not just be about cool features and how quickly we can get them to market or how we can compete to drive down costs. Instead, she said that the guidelines represent, quote, an agreement that the most important thing that needs to be done at the design phase is security. Now, even as that group of nations was signing that document, Russian leader Vladimir Putin was identifying AI as the latest battleground with the West and something that Russia would be pouring more money into. From The Independent, Putin has claimed that AI models like OpenAI's ChatGPT and Google's Bard chatbots, quote, cancel Russian culture and that the West holds a dangerous dominance of the technology. He added, our innovation should rest on our traditional values and the wealth and beauty of the Russian language. And again, even as all of that is happening, we're hearing more about the Pentagon's continued work on AI in autonomous weapons as part of the initiative that has been dubbed Replicator. Back in August, Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks said that Replicator seeks to, quote, galvanize progress in the too slow shift of U.S. military innovation to leverage platforms that are small, smart, cheap, and many. Overall, I think one of the most fascinating aspects of the AI wars right now is the extent to which they are playing out not just in the big tech labs, but in the halls of the most powerful militaries in the world. And of course, in many ways, those concerns should probably just as top of mind as any others that we have around AI, given that there's no signs of slowing that down anytime soon. However, for now, that is going to do it for today's AI Breakdown Brief. Next up, the main AI Breakdown.